If you would please open your Bibles to Philippians 4. We are nearing the end. Thanks. Philippians 4, verses 2 to 9. We have two more SGA chapels, everybody. That is wild. Don't you celebrate. (laughs) Oh, man. Philippians 4, 2 to 9. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there is anything excellent and praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, let your name be often on our lips as we cry tears of joy or sadness, grief or celebration, fear or comfort. In bitter times and sweet times, let us taste the riches of your mercy and grace to us, Father. God, remove all distraction from our hearts and minds today that we may remember you have sent your Son given us your word, equipped us with your spirit, and now, Father, we pray that your will be done in our lives. We submit our lives to you. We submit our lives to you. It shouldn't be as difficult as it is sometimes, but we submit our lives as broken and unedited to you. Let David Carter be quiet. Let your voice be heard in full volume through these words you have in front of us today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God. In your heavenly, holy, perfect name we pray, amen. I don't know how many of you have had a similar time as Uh, the time that I first beat my dad in tennis, but that was pretty much the pinnacle of my life. (laughs) It was something that I had trained for my entire life, my whole adolescent years, Uh, from the age of four to the age of 12. It was April 28th. Believe it or not, one tennis match impacted my life so much, I remember the date. Um, Sorry, tennis team. It's just, that's the only one I remember. Um, So there was this, I I still remember it. I was in Fort Hood, Texas at the time. Uh, It was my first year there. And I had had trained like for a while. My dad taught me everything I knew. So he was my coach for the longest time. And you hear about the first time, you know, runners beat their dad in in running or uh, the first time people that play pool beat their dad in pool or something. But there's, there's something about this, this pinnacle achievement, this milestone of your life where you have finally defeated that person that taught you everything. The student has beat the master or whatever. It's not like the roles actually flipped in this moment. It's just one time and uh, I suffered for a while after that. I, the main thing that I want to describe about this moment is 
I mean, I remember the date, so it was really important to me, but this was something that I had looked forward to for so, so long. I remember the week leading up to it, dad had told me that we were gonna go play at this one, this one place, this one time, so I was like, this is the moment. Okay, I've gotten good. I've got this new grip on my forehand. We're gonna do this. So I really, really wanted this. I played through the match in my head the night before, uh, I practiced so hard that week, hydrated like a maniac, like I never did when I was little. Um, I, got, I got super nervous for the first time when I was playing. Um, and I remember we got to 6'6", we to and we played tiebreaker at 6'6", six, six, right? And uh, this was like the most epic one set could ever get because it's neck and neck. We're at 6'6", six, six, in the tiebreaker, you gotta win by two, so it's going back and forth. He has a match point, I have a match point, I have another match point. Um, it's just great, I'm living it up. But I would have literally done anything to win that match, including cheat for the first time ever. Now, okay, before you judge me, before you get there, uh, it was so ridiculous, it didn't actually offend, affect the match. But I was super nervous. I was up, let's just say, 8-7, okay? I was getting ready to win. And uh, we're playing a match. 40-ball rally is super long, super epic. And, I mean, the ball was like this far in. And I'm like, that was out. I'm super excited. I go up to shake my dad's hand. He's like, that was in, David. Let's, let's play it again. So, anyway. Um, <laughs> I did that, but um, the point is, I would, have, I would have seriously done anything to win that match. That, that meant so much to me. I was looking forward to it. And what I want us to see today when we get to Philippians 4 is um, we're in the context of something in Philippians that Paul has really put us in the mindset for. He is eagerly awaiting a savior from heaven to come down and transform our lowly bodies into this glorious body so that we can be united with him in this wonderful place of heaven where there's no boundaries, there's no hindrances or obstacles where we can be with our Savior. Now we come to this almost shocking place where he says, hey, Euodia, Syntyche, get it together, all right? Act up. But this is a, this is a, a thing of love where he is exhorting them and then he says, rejoice, and gives us uh, some things to do to stand firm in this way, in the, in the way of citizens of heaven. So we're going to walk through some of these imperatives, some of the things that Paul is telling us to do in light of uh, practice these things and, and what it means to live as a citizen of heaven that we see in chapter 320 and chapter 127 and uh, all of these imperatives that Paul is telling us to do. So these are the four characteristics of a God-saturated believer, one who is eagerly awaiting this heavenly reality that is ahead. I want us to see that a gospel-saturated believer that is enamored with God is no longer entangled with the grip of the world. A gospel-saturated believer that is enamored with God is no longer entangled with the grip of this world, the things that make you bicker with your roommates, the, the ones that are persecuting you. Those things don't matter anymore. The things that keep you anxious, the papers, the exams, the job applications, the interviews, sermons, prayers, those things don't, don't affect you in an anxious kind of way because we are so focused on this heavenly reality that is coming. So first today I want us to see in verse four, he talks about joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. There are a couple, I'll say deviants, from this typical pattern of Paul just saying, okay, agree. Help them. Uh, in this case, rejoice. Don't be anxious. Pray. 
he gives a couple imperatives that are just pretty straightforward. But there are a couple that we're going to focus on today. There are four of them that have extra explanations or extra emphasis. This one is rejoice. Again, I'll say it, rejoice. And we remember this because of chapter 1, verse 18, chapter 2, verse 2, and chapter 3, verse 1, where he is emphasizing this rejoice theme. If you remember in chapter 1, verse 18, it's, it's a similar phrase, rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. And that passage is in the same context of conflict, where people are trying to stir up trouble for Paul while he is in chains. And he says, I don't care, I don't care what conflict is happening, I don't care what they're saying about me or what they're trying to do for me, because Christ is being preached. That's the, that's the main thing that I care about here. And in chapter two, he starts to set up this example of what it is to be Christ-like. We're supposed to have this mind of Christ, but, and that is making Paul's joy complete because all of us together, if we're having the mind of Christ and pointed towards that direction in heaven, that is what, that's what's supposed to give us this joy this gospel-oriented joy, both us and seeing others go towards the glory of God. And in chapter three, as we discussed last time, we have no confidence in the flesh because of the work of the gospel, the righteousness that is found in Christ through faith. And so all of these, all of these instruments of joy, these uh, conditions of joy are setting us towards the glory of God. And that is what Paul is trying to demonstrate in chapter 2 with all of these examples and in chapter 4 with all of the things that we're supposed to be doing as a gospel-saturated believer. The main thing that I want to focus on with this joy is that God is preached, the focus is on God, and finally the glory is to God. So the first thing that a gospel-saturated believer enamored with God has is joy. The second is gentleness. We see in verse 5, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Again, we're in a context of conflict, and let, let's go back to this verse 2 and verse 3 construction where he starts to plead with Euodia and Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. These two are believers that have contended side by side for the cause of the gospel. They're one of these uh, citizens of heaven that Paul has described in chapter 1 and chapter 3. So these are people that are supposed to have a specific kind of life and act in a specific kind of way. So why are they, why are they bickering? I don't think Paul recognizes what they're talking about or anything like that, but as this letter was read to the church at Philippi, he was specifically calling out two people that were having some conflict or causing divisions maybe in the church. So for him to call out these people has to be something, maybe not spectacular, but at least significant for him to call out two specific people in the church. And I want us to recognize that this is something that He's calling out in love, and he says, I want, I want Euodia and Syntyche to understand what it is to live a life of the gospel, especially in unity with one another, because we can't be striving side by side for the faith of the gospel if we are tearing it at each other's throats, if we are cutting them down behind their back, or even in front of their face, if you have that kind of gall. We can't, we can't have teams of people in, in the faith. We have one team, and that is the team that is oriented towards the glory of God, not the glory of David Carter or you and whoever you are bickering with or upset with. Or, in a, in a context of Christianity, here at Cedarville, I know there are many of you that just are kind of harboring these things in your heart. And there's something about your roommate or that person in your hall or DL group or class that just, it grinds your gears. But you're a Christian, so you're going to suppress it. 
And you're just gonna feel it in your heart and you're not gonna tell anybody about it because you're this justified person, right? But at the end of the day, who is that helping? At the end of the day, who are you relying on to take care of your burdens? So I want us to focus on and maybe not encouraging, hey, go fix all your problems today and go talk to every single person that you think uh, has something little that annoys you because that probably won't end up super well if you're just telling everybody what's wrong with them. But I want us to learn from the lessons of Romans 12 that, that quotes Proverbs 25. It says, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. Paul expands on this and says, do not overcome, uh, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Paul's focusing on the gospel saturated believer and how even with our enemies, our reaction to them should be love. Think about Jesus who came into a world that rejected him and didn't want him and ended up crucifying him their savior. So if anyone is to love, should it not be Christians who are affected by the love of the God of the universe? I think so. And I think Paul would say that as well. Now he says something interesting in verse five as well. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Many scholars debate on whether the Lord is near is supposed to apply to what is said before it let your gentleness be there, or the Lord is near applies to this, uh, this prayer language. Him being near is means of us being able to pray and have intercession with God. Well, I'd argue from 320, as our citizenship is in heaven, we eagerly await the Savior from heaven to reunite us with him and this is, this is going to indicate how we live our lives as gospel believers. This expectation for the one who is to come is going to dictate our lives, remember? And so, because we have this expectation and we know that that coming is very soon, it's very near, we want to be conducting our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel right now. Think about what you do on a Saturday night to prepare for Sunday morning. Is that how you want your Lord and Savior to come and find you when he returns? I'm sure Yodi and Syntyche, whatever their disagreement was, was not something they would be proud to display before the Lord if he were to come back during their bickering. So we have joy. The gospel-saturated believer has gentleness. And as we talked about plenty last semester, the gospel-saturated believer prays. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. For a moment, I was tempted to focus on the peace of God as a tool or a characteristic of a gospel-saturated believer, but I wanted to focus on prayer again because peace of God, yes, while we have it, that comes through the prayer in all things. And if you don't have the peace of God, prayer is the way to get there. It is the peace of God, which he has plenty of, in his richness of mercy, in his richness of grace. But Paul's Paul's command here is to pray in order to get this peace. And it's interesting that this peace alleviates our anxiety. I know that there are many of you that struggle with this. Anxiety is one of those things that just happens. Whether it's because you've not really slept that much and uh, you're just tired and your filter is weak or there's actually a lot going on in your life. I know there are always exams and papers and things to be done. There are always people to minister to and talk to. There are always problems to be addressed and those things can get 
very exhausting. And sometimes those things make us so egocentric and they put everything on us and what's happening with us and what we need to do. But the interesting thing about the prayer that Paul encourages to do is it is adorned with thanksgiving. And this type of prayer is so focused on the Lord and what he has done, sometimes this takes our eyes from below and all the things that are surrounding us and it lifts our eyes to heaven to see the graciousness and the mercy and the kindness of our Lord. We can adorn our prayers with thanksgiving, number one, because we can, we can be thankful. We can see all the things around us and just be thankful for the creation uh, and the graciousness of God that abounds. We can be thankful because God has been faithful throughout our entire history of humanity. And let's not confuse this with kindness. One of my friends who I think isn't here today, so I'm safe saying this, um, he has this, he has this spiel about uh, not confusing God's faithfulness with kindness. And I think that's, that's a great distinction to make so that we don't get entitled. As if the things that we are thankful for uh, that God just richly blesses upon us are something that we're entitled to because we're here and we do wonderful things and we are good Christians. That is such a temptation that we have. And if we attribute God's kindness to his faithfulness, sometimes it leads to that kind of thing. And we can adorn our prayers with thanksgiving despite God answering a prayer because he is good regardless. There are many of you that lack that peace of God right now in your life. There's so many of you that are really struggling with grief and pain and anxiety. I want us to recognize that I want us to translate our lives through the lens of our God. Start with our God and translate our life rather than start with our life and then translate our God. Our questions become so much more potent and understandable when we start with an understanding of the supremacy, the goodness, the graciousness, the faithfulness of our God, rather than imprinting God's goodness and graciousness and faithfulness based off of the chaos that surrounds us. And Paul says pray and, and ask God for things and let him know where your heart is, but be thankful because our God is that good and that gracious. Think about the Psalms. Psalm 136, 117, uh, from 4212. He's saying, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. He's saying to himself, hope, believe the God that you know. Have that Have that image of God that you have in your brain, let that translate to your heart. Don't be so, uh, don't succumb to the chaos that is around you. There are so many good things that are in this life. I feel like so often we take our prayers and we treat them like Hail Mary passes. We have a big thing that comes up. Scholarship applications or jobs for seniors or internships or classes or things like that. And we say, God, Bless me. I want this super bad. And that's, that's okay. Sometimes we need the Hail Mary passes. Sometimes there are dire situations. But it's almost as if that is the only type of play that we know. That's the only type of way that we approach prayer. And we hang our faith in God on those really slim chances. Sometimes those aren't things that God wants in your life. And if you're praying once and God says no, then your picture of God's faithfulness and kindness to you is so slim. Imagine if you prayed for everything, both in thanksgiving and in petition, things that you desire and things that you have. Think about how vast your view of God will be if you're completing short passes or grinding through the run game. You're going to make so much more progress towards the goal of faithfulness if that's where we're headed. 
So a gospel-saturated believer has this joy in the gospel, the reality that is to come. It translates into gentleness towards believers and those around us. It is dictated by a life of prayer and thanksgiving that leads towards ultimate peace that passes all understanding. And lastly, we practice, and this leads to the God of peace. Now we have this, um, this picture here of these wonderful things to think about, whatever is true, noble, admirable, lovely, wonderful, excellent, praiseworthy. Paul says, practice these things, do these things. You're a gospel-saturated believer. Live this kind of way. This is what it's like to be a citizen of heaven. I mentioned tennis earlier. You know, if I was trying to play my dad and I practiced all of that time with the racket backwards and I was trying to hit everything with the handle, maybe my accuracy would get better over time just because I have such a small part to hit the ball on. But that's not the way you play tennis. You get way better at things the more that you do them. And if you do the good things, you'll get better at those. If you do the bad things, you'll get better at those. And if the Lord is near... What kinds of things should we be practicing? What kinds of things should we be doing? Well, you know them in your life. It's whatever is true and noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable. I could ask any, every one of you, think of one thing that doesn't fit in that list. And if we were to go about our lives and, and slowly eradicate those things in our lives, how much more would we become like Christ? How, how much more eagerly would that show to non-believers what kind of life we're headed towards? Wouldn't that be so wonderful if other universities in the area began to look at us in the way that we practiced Christ-likeness in our lives and started to think it was so peculiar and so intriguing that, uh, that they asked us questions about it and started to investigate for themselves what it's all about. Ben, if you'd come on up. So if you do something long enough, it becomes habit, good or bad. Reading the Bible, staying up late, swinging the tennis racket properly, holding your musical instrument, sleeping in, skills for nursing. I want us all to be so enamored with God, that we're no longer entangled with the grips of this world. I want us to be so focused on becoming like Christ in that moment where we will meet him and say, that is who I have wanted to meet my whole life. That is who I am made to be like. I want us to be so excited for that, that anxiety, bitterness towards those around us, disunity, those things become, no, they no longer entangle us. They're no longer enticing. And I want to tell you, our, our God is so worth that. I'll leave you with this, a quote from Charles Haddon, Mr. Spurgeon. He who climbs above the cares of the world and turns his face to God has found the sunny side of life. The world side of the hill is chill and freezing to a spiritual mind. But the Lord's presence gives warmth, a warmth of joy which turns winter into summer. Let us all enjoy that summer season.